Hello, I'm Scott Turner, and I'd like to welcome you to my short course on evolution. Let me first tell you a little bit about myself. I'm a biologist, specifically a physiologist. Physiology is concerned with how life works, how the heart works, how the kidneys work, how food is digested, you know, those sorts of things. But I'm also very interested in evolution. And what's the connection, you might ask? Well, okay, here's the connection. I've built my entire research career around one simple question. What does the science of how life works, physiology in a word, have to say about how life evolves? I've been thinking about this question for a long time, and the answer I've arrived at has put me in a rather, how shall we say, heterodox place. The mainstream thinking about evolution, as you probably know, is dominated by what I will call the Darwinian idea. And what's that? Well, it's the claim that evolution operates through a kind of machine called natural selection. There's a subtext in there. Because evolution operates through this mechanism, it follows that evolution works without any kind of guiding intelligence. An automobile engine, for example, is not intelligent, but it still drives the car from point A to point B. In a similar way, the engine of natural selection drives lineages of creatures from time A to time B, and that's the Darwinian idea. When I started off in my research career, I was a pretty staunch Darwinist. Now, 30 years later, I no longer am, and in this course, I want to tell you why. I'm no mere critic of the Darwinian idea, though. Critics are always a dime a dozen. So I'll also lay out an answer to my question. What does physiology have to say about evolution? It has quite a lot to say, actually, which led me to a radical alternative to what evolution is, how it works, and what drives it. I have another aim. Evolution is certainly a scientific problem, but it's only partly a scientific issue. It's also a scientistic issue. And what do I mean by that word, scientistic? Scientism is the doctrine that scientific understanding of one thing licenses scientists to opine on other things. The dictionary definition of scientism is this, an excessive belief in the power of scientific knowledge and techniques. In short, scientism is actually a kind of scientific imperialism. In evolution, scientism appears in the claim that the Darwinian idea concerned initially with a comparatively narrow question like the origin of new species, licenses Darwinists to pronounce on broader questions for our society and our culture. Now, in one sense, there's really nothing wrong with that. Science, like art or literature, is an expression of our culture. And evolution is embedded in some very large cultural questions. How we came to be, how the natural world works, our relationships with the natural world and with each other. All are important questions that we really should be asking ourselves, and evolution has some important things to say about them. So it's very important that we get evolution right. The argument I'll make is this. For about a hundred years now, we have been getting evolution wrong, and Darwinian scientism is the reason. Darwinian scientism periodically erupts into public view in repeating controversies over teaching evolution in schools. Ever since the Scopes trial in 1925, the controversy has always been framed as a gross caricature, as a battle between enlightened science and clouded superstition. In these controversies, the face of Darwinian scientism is always the same that Darwinism must be the sole framework for the biological sciences, and no other views can be tolerated. And that's why I describe scientism as a form of scientific imperialism. Darwinism has conquered our cultural space rather than persuaded its way in. 
I want to illustrate Darwinian scientism in four quotations from prominent evolutionary thinkers. I opened my book, Purpose and Desire, with these quotations, and the first is from the late historian of Darwinism, Will Provine. There are no gods, no purpose, no goal-directed forces of any kind. There is no ultimate foundation for ethics, no ultimate meaning to life, and no free will for humans either. Okay, let's hear from Francis Crick, who discovered the double helix of DNA, along with James Watson. Science has shown you that your joys and your sorrows, your memories and your ambitions, your sense of identity and free will are in fact no more than the behavior of a vast assembly of nerve cells and their associated molecules. As Lewis Carroll's Alice might have phrased it, you are nothing but a pack of neurons. All right, okay, let's hear from Richard Dawkins, who you might know as the author of The God Delusion. The universe we observe has precisely the properties we should expect if there is, at bottom, no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, and nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. Had enough? Well, too bad, because I want to allow the philosopher Daniel Dennett to weigh in. Dennett is a prominent practitioner of Darwinian scientism. No matter how impressive the products of an algorithm, that is natural selection, the underlying process always consists of nothing but a series of individually mindless steps succeeding each other without the help of any intelligent supervision. Okay, you get the idea. Science demonstrates that life is purposeless, unintelligent, and mechanistic. And the hidden text is that our public lives, if they're to be guided by science, must adopt a similar ethos of nihilism. It's the only rational approach. Talk about scientific overreach. But if the Darwinian idea is wrong, as I contend that it is, then the whole scientistic stance falls apart. I'm going to be a little scientistic myself now. There is an alternative and a completely scientific way to think about evolution that does not lead us into nihilism. Maybe that will enrich our public discourse? I don't know, but I hope so. Let me map out how I'll take you through this alternative I say heterodox view of evolution. I didn't get to where I am overnight. As I said, I was a pretty staunch Darwinist for a long time, but I eventually concluded that I couldn't be a Darwinist any longer. This was not the result of any kind of religious insight or conversion. I am a Christian, although, as I often say, I'm not really a very good one. But Darwinism and I parted company actually because the science led me away. At some point, the science could no longer support a Darwinian view of evolution and how it works. I've been working through this problem in three books. These books are, if you will, the waypoints of my departure from Darwinism. The first waypoint is what I call the extended organism idea. My book, The Extended Organism, was concerned with the nature of the organism, and I was led to write it because of my work on an unusual type of organism, the so-called superorganism of social insect colonies. In my case, it was colonies of these, colonies of southern African termites that build these colossal earthen mounds. These mounds are not simply piles of dirt. They are, in fact, organs of physiology. It's a wind-driven lung for the underground colony. In other words, these termites create new organs of physiology, and they make them by gluing together innumerable grains of sand and clay. And being a physiologist, I wanted to know how these termites pulled off this trick. Along the way, I was led into a different way of thinking about this idea of the organism. Now, I'm an organism, and so are all the animals and plants we share the world with, but we identify organisms usually as being contained within a skin of some sort. 
In the case of the termites, the mound itself is as alive as the termites that build it. The mound is part of an extended organism. And what makes the mound alive actually applies to other, more conventional organisms. I, and you for that matter, are also extended organisms because our existence does not end at our skins. We'll be exploring some of the strange aspects of this idea during this course. My second book, The Tinkerer's Accomplice, was concerned with the problem of biological design. Why is it that organisms appear to be well-designed, built as if an engineer had designed them? Our bones, for example, are shaped pretty closely to how a structural engineer would design them to support the loads that they are expected to bear. The Darwinian idea has a simple answer to this question. It's an illusion. Bones aren't designed. They just appear to be. There was no designer at work. Take a look back at those quotations. In The Tinkerer's Accomplice, I argue that this fallback to apparent design was a dodge. Organisms are designed. We can see this from simple inspection. The important question is how they come to this state. My answer is that design is at root a phenomenon of adaptation. Now that doesn't sound very controversial on its own. Darwinists are fine with the phenomenon of adaptation. The problem is that Darwinism does not have a coherent theory of adaptation. Physiology can actually lead us to a coherent theory of adaptation, but that theory undercuts the Darwinian notion of evolution as a soulless mechanism. Rather, adaptation is, at heart, an intelligent and intentional phenomenon. It is, in fact, a fundamental property of life itself. And this means that adaptation is not the result of evolution, it's the intelligent driver of evolution. My third book, Purpose and Desire, outlines my complete break with the Darwinian idea. My argument is quite simple. Life is self-evidently a unique phenomenon of the universe. What makes it unique is that it is purposeful and intentional. One would be very hard-pressed to find a purposefulness in, say, the motions of the planets, but one would be equally hard-pressed to deny that living things are purposeful. The question is, where does that purposefulness come from? In Purpose and Desire, I build a theory of adaptation that is built upon life being a cognitive phenomenon. Living things know something about the world, and because life exists in the form of extended organisms, life can act upon this knowledge of the world. At the heart of this is a unique property of life, a tendency to persist through time. This property is called homeostasis. Adaptation, homeostasis, and the extended organism come together to produce a theory of evolution that is purposeful, intentional, and intelligent. Because the Darwinian idea rejects these properties as somehow illusory, my own theory of evolution departs radically from it. So, this is a long story that has played out for me over many years. In the end, I found myself confronted with a dilemma that I could no longer ignore. Life is either purposeful, or its purposefulness is an illusion. If the purposefulness is real, Darwinism cannot be correct. If Darwinism is correct, purposefulness cannot be real. I came to conclude that purposefulness was, in fact, quite real. And that's when I concluded that Darwinism could not be a coherent theory of evolution, or even a correct theory of evolution. Thank mm -hmm. you.